Make up mine. So, full disclosure, I originally planned to review Spongebob Squarepants The Cosmic Shake as my video for February this year. For context, I'm trying to get out at least one video a month every month. But then, something happened. Pizza Tower. Pizza Tower is a game that I was very much aware of during its development. I'm someone who tends to follow indie developers and update blogs and stuff, so it was pretty much impossible for me not to be made aware of Pizza Tower at some point. I didn't, however, actively follow its development. I wasn't in its Discord, I wasn't on its Patreon, and I wasn't following each build that was exhaustively released throughout its five-year development cycle. I was just aware of it as that wacky Wario Land-inspired Italian simulator platformer game. So, color me surprised when, in December of 2022, the game Steam page goes up, and lists the release date of the following month with a flashy trailer and loads of stellar art to boot. As someone who wasn't following its development and was only tangentially aware of the game's existence, I had no idea that Pizza Tower was anywhere near coming out. But it was only $20, and seemed like a lot of love and passion had gone into it, and I like to support indie developers where I can, so I picked it up. I started playing it, and something became very apparent very quickly. This game is really, really good. Like, you know that upper tier of really great indie games that manage to pierce the general gaming consciousness and become titans of their genres all on their own? Games like Shovel Knight, Celeste, Omori, things like that? Yeah, Pizza Tower definitely belongs in that tier. This is a game that, from the moment you start playing it, absolutely bleeds passion and love. This is a game that was clearly developed out of an extremely precise vision with very few artistic compromises along the way. This is a game unlike anything else I've ever played. This is Pizza Tower. Consider this a retrospective for a month-old game. We're gonna do a deep dive into this deep dish and see just what makes Pizza Tower so special. It's gonna be a fun ride. Pizza Tower was primarily developed by Mick Pig, formerly known as Pizza Tower Guy, under the company name of Tour Day Pizza with his team. Despite the game's wacky Wario Land-inspired energy and gameplay being among its most obvious and lauded features, this actually wasn't the original vision for the game at all. Mick Pig had initially envisioned a horror-themed comic about an Italian chef fighting pizza monsters inside a pizzeria, and it conceptualized an RPG game titled Pizza Massacre based on the idea. This concept eventually shifted and morphed into the Pizza Tower we know today. Mick Pig had previously Previously been working on a game with a similar style to Pizza Tower, known as Wieners Don't Use Drugs, but decided to put that project on the back burner to fully commit to Pizza Tower. Initially titled The Leaning Tower of Pizza, Pizza Tower began development and was first shown off in March of 2018 through McPig's Tumblr. From here, the game's official Discord, Patreon, and various pieces of promotional and test material were released to the internet, allowing both buzz and funding for the game to generate passively through word of mouth. Many, many different in-progress builds of Pizza Tower were released from 2018 to its official launch, along with a plethora of art and information regarding the game's characters and settings. A big movement happened in September of 2019, where the game was showcased at the Sonic Amateur Games Expo, or SAGE, with a build that many high-profile creators and YouTubers played and enjoyed. This massively boosted Pizza Tower's visibility in the public eye and kicked its momentum up a ton. Builds and updates continued being released throughout the late 2010s and early 2020s, with the game eventually receiving its Steam page and releasing for PC on January 26, 2023. The game was a big success. It's currently unknown how many copies the game has shipped, but it presently sits at a 99% positive review score on Steam out of over 4,000 reviews as I'm recording this, and has been receiving a ton of FaceTime on platforms like YouTube and Twitch. I don't tend to put too much stock into Steam reviews for most stuff, it's a little too meme-based, and people will literally give things like Not Safe for Work Nazi games very positive reviews, but the fact that this little breakout indie game has managed to comfortably maintain a level of approval on Steam that most AAA indie games with much larger budgets couldn't even begin to scrape is a very impressive deal. One thing I want to touch on before we move on to the game itself is the absolute plethora of concept art and pre-release material this game had. A lot of it is really, really funny, and provides a lot of great insight into the intended mechanics, settings, and characters of the game. Pizza Tower left a lot on the cutting room floor, and most of it is safely archived at multiple points online. One thing I want to talk about specifically is this hilarious series of comics and doodles featuring the characters being annoyed by Noisette, a very minor character in the game itself who was all over the pre-release material. These comics are absolutely hilarious, and I'd strongly recommend anyone interested in the game to give them a read. Hey! 
<laughs> That's so embarrassing, Mr. Pepino. I forgot to put the buns. I asked for spaghetti. You are also going to have to fight my boyfriend, The Noise, in World 3 to progress. Alright, great. Pepino, help me fit more things into my mouth. Alright, I'll take my morning coffee this afternoon then. So, why do you wear the rabbit costume? Is it to get closer to nature in some way while tangled up in society's expectations? Is it a symbol of anarchy or maybe it's meant this to guy is so dumb. Are you e Even separated from the funny comics, Pizza Tower has an absolute wealth of unused sprites and mechanics, and you can get a lot of insight into the game's development and McPig's ideas for things by browsing through them. It's really interesting stuff. I understand that some of this stuff is intended to be re-added to the game in future content updates, so look through it if you're at all interested in what we could see in the game in the future. Now, in videos like these, my long-form retrospective type stuff, I usually like to talk about games in a development, story, presentation, gameplay order. But in the case of Pizza Tower, though, the presentation kind of slaps you in the face and speaks for itself, so let's talk about that first. I've described Pizza Tower to friends as not looking like any other game I've ever played, but I want to take it a step further and say that it doesn't look like any other piece of officially released and published media I've ever seen before. This game looks straight out of a 2000s Newgrounds cartoon with obvious homages to 90s Nickelodeon, and honestly, I love everything about it. I am not exaggerating when I say that Pizza Tower is one of the best looking, most fluid, most animated, expressive, charming games I've ever played. It's to a point where you could realistically tell someone who knows nothing about the game that any random gameplay clip is an original animation made to resemble a video game, and they'd probably believe you, like a mock-up or something. The game's just that incredible in terms of visuals. It's such a unique, deliberately sloppy and goofy art style that I just love. So many of the individual frames and drawings are laugh out loud funny and eye-catching in and of themselves, and and completely removed from their context or jokes, they're still hilarious. This is a game that, on an aesthetic level, is unlike anything I've ever seen developed or released on this scale, video game or not. The closest thing would probably be something like Smiling Friends. It's truly astonishing, and I have a massive amount of respect for McPig and the work he was able to do here. It's no wonder this game took over five years to develop. I've heard some people say that the game looks amateurish or ugly, but that's literally the point. The game has an extremely precise stylistic vision that I'd say absolutely nails. The character designs specifically are top-notch, and I really admire how McPig was able to create characters that are cartoony, expressive, and elastic enough to hop into all these different dynamic poses and expressions without ever feeling off-model or out of character. They can go from fairly on-model and readable to wacky Looney Tunes squash and stretch in a moment's notice, and it always feels appropriate and exceptionally funny. The game is also chock full of these little touches that really didn't need to be there, but ultimately add so much to the overall experience. Every level has a unique title card that'll vary in purpose from foreshadowing the theme of the level to actively deceiving the player. There are a ton of different states the HUDs can begin, with the television in the corner having different animations and images for pretty much every state the player can enter, from power-ups to taking damage to everything in between. There's a ton of these little blink-and-you-miss-it type transition screens, which just kill me every time they appear. They're overtly goofy art, the silence that accompanies them, the fact that they're only on screen for a few frames, they really have no reason to be here, yet they add so much to the game. Every menu is unique and dynamic, featuring unique art effects and music. The game even jump scares you and forces a crash if you idle on the main menu for over 40 seconds. There's literally no need for this, it's not a horror game, it's just fucking funny. Every level is coded in little details, designs, and textures that you'll probably breeze right past, but are there anyways. Every level has unique backgrounds, there are so many frames of animation for literally every character and asset, it's all staggering. And there's even more stuff like this that I haven't even mentioned. There's no conceivable way that the player will notice every artistic nuance in this game on their first or even second playthrough. It's a goofy game, but one ultimately filled with incredibly sharp decisions and a keen eye for detail. The music also furthers this feeling of bouncy kinetic cartoon energy. The soundtrack was primarily composed by Mr. Saucemen and Klasky Jitto, with contributions by some other artists throughout the track as well. The music is super varied and diverse, with pretty much all of the songs being in equal parts enjoyable and fitting to the scenarios they appear in. There's also a really good mix of different sounds and styles. The game generally leans pretty hard into Hideki Naganuma-esque techno-funk, with a lot of guitar-heavy tracks thrown in as well, and a ton of samples throughout the OSD. I've heard some people say 
say that the game might actually go overboard with the samples, since pretty much every song has some kind of isolated voice clip or sound effect somewhere in it, but to me, it leans more into being a deliberate stylistic choice rather than an overused gimmick. Some of my favorite tracks that have to be Deep Dish 9 and Blood Sauce Dungeons themes, Fast Food Saloon's theme is really good, and pretty much all of the boss tracks are bangers. You'd expect a game like this to lean really hard in the synth retro style stuff, or stereotypical Italian type music, but there's a lot of different styles that use a lot of different instruments present in the OST. The game's main theme is definitely It's Pizza Time, a track that's remixed throughout the game, but primarily plays during the end-of-level escape sequences, and is also very good. By this point, we've talked extensively about the game's history and presentation, so let's get down to the brass tacks of the game itself. Pizza Tower follows Peppino Spaghetti, a portly Italian stereotype whose business, Peppino's Pizza, has fallen on hard times. On top of his financial woes, he's a generally anxious and angry person, particularly due to Pizza Face, a mysterious living pizza showing up and threatening to destroy his pizzeria. So Peppino, in a moment of pure Italiano rage, sets out to storm Pizza Face's base of operations, the mysterious Pizza Tower, defeat the evil pizza, and save his business. He's joined along the way by Gustavo and Brick, a gnome and mouse duo who help out in places, and Mr. Stick, a con man who grants Peppino access to new bosses and floors for a small price. He's also allegedly one of McPig's oldest characters, and one he's drawn significantly more than Peppino. One thing I particularly like is Peppino's characterization. Despite being an obvious Italian caricature, he's consistently depicted as just an angry and fed-up business owner who's trying to save his restaurant. He's not overly heroic or stalwart, he's not exceptionally angry or edgy, he's not confident or wisecracking, he's just kind of sick of everyone around him's bullshit. He's shown to be frustrated and anxious, and even kind of bumbling at some points, but who wouldn't be in his situation? You see these kinds of characters a lot in TV and movies and stuff, but video game protagonists generally try to shoot for more archetypal, cool, or subversive characters. Peppino is very enjoyable in this respect. There could have been a desire to just make him a one-note Italian stereotype or an overly subversive loser-type character, but beyond his name and design, he really is his own character with a lot of expressiveness. He's also apparently a war veteran, which explains a lot. In terms of raw gameplay, Pizza Tower obviously wears its Wario Land-inspired influence on its sleeve. It's clearly a game made out of love for a series that Nintendo refuses to iterate on these days. That said, it's far from a Wario Land clone, or even a Wario-like, quote-unquote. This is a game that stands comfortably on its own merits, removed from its Wario influences. It shares a lot in common as well with classic Sonic, Mischief Makers, and even some Metroidvania or shooting-heavy platformers. But more than anything else, Pizza Tower is itself, and it knows that. Let's get into detail about the gameplay of Pizza Tower. At a base, Pizza Tower is a 2D platformer with a large focus on speed and momentum-based progression. The player controls Pepino, as he speeds through levels, running roughshod through blocks, walls, enemies, and whatever else stands in the way of him saving his pizzeria. The main goal of each level is to reach Pillar John, a large pillar with a face, at which point a countdown will start, and the player will have to take a new path back through the level to reach the exit. The player is then ranked on their performance, and they can move on to the next level. It might sound pretty simple and even repetitive, but let me tell you, this game gilds the lily a lot. For starters, are Peppino's abilities. When just walking and jumping normally, Peppino is pretty slow and even kind of clumsy, and you won't get far moving like this. The player is intended to hold down the dedicated dash button at pretty much all times, at which point Peppino will start steadily gaining speed as he runs, eventually leading a mad Mach 3 dash that allows him to bust through anything in his path. The speeds that the player can reach in this game are absolutely insane, and precise reaction speeds can allow you to easily blast through levels. Peppino almost controls like a car when he's at this speed, allowing the player to Italiano drift to reposition themselves while maintaining their momentum. The overall speed and momentum-based platforming is one of the most satisfying and enjoyable things about this game. It's like classic Sonic, but with level designs that actually accommodate the movement mechanics. What? Tell me I'm wrong. As far as attacking goes, Peppino is both capable of defeating enemies by dashing through them at high speeds and by grabbing and throwing them. The grab has multiple throws that can be done out of it, such as a horizontal toss, a downward pile driver, and an upward uppercut, and the direction you choose to throw enemies in is important, as it can impact how many enemies you can take out at once, which leads to impacting your combo meter. The higher your combo, the more points you get. The more points you get, the higher your rank at the end of each level. Peppino is also capable of rolling, super jumping, and ground pounding, which allows the player to navigate specific 
specific obstacles and platform vertically in addition to their speedy horizontal movement. The faster the player is going and the higher up they are when they ground pound will determine what they can bust through, so maintaining high speeds and momentum is the name of the game. I'm honestly not a huge fan of how the super jump is initiated by default. With the player needing to tilt the control stick up while moving at high speeds, it can make it difficult to accurately super jump into specific places, but to the game's credit, it lets you rebind most of Pepino's abilities after a recent patch, which is very neat. The player also has a taunt at their disposal, which serves a double purpose. Not only does it earn you extra points towards your score at the end of a level, and generally features loads of unique and great Pepino sprites, but it also allows you to parry enemy attacks. If you taunt right as an enemy hits you, Pepino will parry the attack, either instantly defeating the enemy or allowing you to pass by them without taking damage. It's super useful, especially in bosses, so I'd recommend going for it in a pinch. You can also perform a super taunt that takes out all enemies on screen at once when meeting certain requirements, but I pretty much always forgot I had the super taunt whenever I did in the game, so there's a lot of footage of me running around with it stored and just never using it. Sorry about that. In addition to Pepino's base abilities, the game also features a huge variety of level-specific gimmicks, power-ups, and unique mechanics. It's very rare that the player will be doing the same things two levels in a row, which keeps the entire game feeling dynamic and fresh. For the most part, though, these iterations on the game design aren't too different from what the player is doing normally, so they don't come off as distractions or diversions, but rather just slight iterations. In one level, you might be golfing around a living grease ball while you platform. In another, you might be avoiding jump-scaring pizzeria animatronics. In the third, you might be traveling on rockets and in alien bubbles. It's a super varied game, and very few levels end up feeling alike by the end. The levels also feature super interesting aesthetics and themes, like Blood Sauce Dungeon, which has this really cool shadow section. You can really only do this in games with standout art styles and strong character silhouettes, and Pizza Tower knocks it out of the park in this regard. There's also literally a level just called Oh Shit, which features Pepino navigating through a shit-filled sewer. Very classy. I love that in the aforementioned pizza animatronic level, Pepino literally just gets a shotgun and starts shooting them by the end of the level. Raises a lot of questions about how characters handle certain other animatronic-based video games. One of my favorites has to be the Pig City, a level that features Pepino navigating a slum occupied by literal pigs. I love the background characters in this level, just look at these jamming pigs, and the running gag of Pepino nervously sitting in the backseat of cabs while being driven around a skeevy, unfamiliar area is very true to life. Equally so when he screams once he realizes that his cab driver isn't going the right way. Speaking of Pepino's scream, this is a sound effect that the game absolutely loves, and every time time it's used, it gets a laugh out of me. They were smart enough not to use it every time Pepino gets damaged or is in a state of shock, which was a smart choice. It kept it from getting stale. <laughs> Back to level-specific gimmicks, Pizza Tower also features a wide array of power-ups, though unlike the power-ups in traditional games, Pizza Towers tend to be a mix of harmful debuffs and helpful buffs, with them temporarily removing some of the player's abilities in exchange for new ones. Because of this, I'd consider them more side grades rather than straight upgrades or downgrades. For example, the Sticky Cheese power-up makes Pepino all around slower, but allows him to stick to walls and wall jump. Another one is the Night Armor, which allows Pepino to double jump and quickly slide off of slopes, but makes him slower and limits his platforming. These power-ups can only be removed by reaching a pizza pope within a level, meaning that the sections that they appear in are deliberately designed to accommodate what they allow you to do. In a lot of cases, there will be a literal rat blocking the player's path that can only be destroyed with a power-up, so if you can't figure out what to do when you see one of these rats around, look around for a power-up. One of these power-ups is also Mort the Chicken, who, for those of you who don't know, is the main character of a generally not well-liked or well-remembered PS1 3D platformer. I'm pretty sure prior to Pizza Tower, like 90% of this this game's cultural footprint was the video Nitro Rad made on it, and apparently Mick Pig just straight up asked the developer of Mort the Chicken if he could use the character in the game, and he said yeah. I think it's entirely on brand and very funny for Pizza Tower to feature this random obscure character in a somewhat major role. I'm into it. Speaking of rats and power-ups, the player will also occasionally hand off sections of levels to Gustavo and Brick, a rat and gnome combo, and Pepino's only real friends. I really like their gameplay, because they don't feel limited or restrictive at all, you don't feel bad when you're playing as them, but they also don't feel like they're straight up better than Pepino, and you're not wishing you were controlling them for the entire game instead of him. They strike a really nice balance and add a really good amount of variety to the levels they appear in. Between the levels, the player will find themselves exploring the dank halls of the Pizza Tower. In these hub areas, 
players can navigate between levels, read tutorials and tips, change between unlocked outfits, check achievements, and look for secrets. There are loads of secret rooms and hidden areas in the hub, and for the most part, they are completely useless, just serving to add flavor and something cool to find in hub areas. I'm honestly pretty into it though, it reminds me of a lot of retro games that just feature random throwaway rooms and easter eggs, it adds a lot of depth and explorability to the tower. Pizza Tower is a game that definitely withholds a lot of its lore and what's going on from the player outside of the surface level, so stuff like this can help a lot in filling in the gaps. Though I will say that having to manually run back through the tower every time you start the game is one of my least favorite parts. Speaking of secrets, each level in Pizza Tower contains up to three secret areas accessed by finding these hidden eye portals throughout the levels. These secrets are usually platforming challenges that adhere to the specific gimmicks of the levels you're playing, and they're really fun. Between the chill music and pink aesthetics, they almost remind me of the headspace sections of Amori, only without making me want to be dead. The secrets can tend to be pretty well hidden, with small clues cueing you into their locations. If you ever see an eye marking on a wall or a mysterious piece of background geometry that seems to point somewhere, try Try looking around that area, there might be a secret. They're well hidden, but often telegraphed. The secrets aren't the only things hidden around levels though, and that's where the toppins come in. In each level, there are five toppins, basically anthropomorphic pizza toppings hidden throughout, trapped in cages waiting for the players to save them. There's a mushroom, cheese, tomato, sausage, and pineapple always in that order. Anytime one is around, you'll hear a distinct booping sound to cue you into its location. For each toppin you collect, you'll be given $10 towards that floor of the tower's boss room, and considering that the boss rooms are required to move on to each new floor, the toppins are absolutely the main things you want to collect. If you don't go for 100% in this game, at least collect the toppins because you do need them to move forward. They're always placed throughout levels in the same order, so if you find, say, a tomato without finding the mushroom and cheese beforehand, then you know you've missed them. There's also the tower's janitor, Jerome, to collect in each level. Jerome can be found just kind of standing around doing his job in each different level, and once the player finds him, they can unlock his hidden janitor closet that contains a trinket within each level. Jerome is probably my least favorite of the level by level collectibles, since finding either the closet or Jerome himself without finding the other is effectively a tremendous waste of time, but if you manage to find both and get the trinket, it'll buff your score like crazy. I just wish Jerome counted for something if you found him on his own. I do like his personality though, he's so disinterested in whatever Pepino is doing and just kind of follows because he needs to. As far as rankings go, the player can be ranked anywhere from D rank to the elusive P rank based on how they perform in each level, with the D rank being denoted as awful and the P rank being perfect. I like how the game is honest with your rankings, with A, S, and P being celebrated, and everything below being jeered. Hey, if you think that's bad, just look at the noises rankings from the scrapped co-op mode. He's literally only impressed if you get an S rank. What a dick. What's worth noting, though, is that aside from the initial level rankings and Pepino's final judgment, the endgame percent tally and ranking, Pizza Tower doesn't have a true ending or anything. You can play at your own pace, collect as much as you want, get whatever ranks you want, and overall have your own experience in Pizza Tower without it withholding any content from you. It might sound weird to say that I appreciate the game having a more linear structure, but I just love that Pizza Tower allows the player to have their own playthrough without sidelining them into a bad ending or anything if they choose not to collect everything. If you want to extend your playtime and get those P ranks, you absolutely can, and if you just want to run through the levels and see the ending, you can do that as well. It's all up to you, and the game won't penalize you for it. On top of all of that, too, reaching the end of a level isn't enough to clear it. Once the player has found Pillar John, the level will kick into its frantic escape portion. Here, a timer begins counting down, and an intense driving track known as It's Pizza Time kicks in, and the player will have to take a mad dash through the level to escape in time. If they fail, then Pizza Face will show up and likely kill the player. This will result in them needing to restart and recollect everything in the entire level, which might sound overly punishing, but it's actually super hard to fail at the escape sections, unless you're either deliberately trying to, or you're really bad at a level-specific gimmick. In both of my playthroughs, it only happened to be about two or three times combined. These escape sections are really fun and thrilling, made even more so by the layout of the level changing once you've knocked out Pillar John, and the player's score slowly being sat from them, both of which really make the player need to act on their toes to escape as fast as possible. You also have Gustavo and Mr. Stick pointing you in the right direction, and clocks layered throughout to help you figure out where to go, so you shouldn't get lost in these. Getting caught by Pizza Face is the only way to actually die in a normal level, since Pepino has infinite health, not unlike Wario in some of the Wario Land games. The game guilts you for getting damage with these ominous You've hurt Pepino this many times messages, but there's really no actual penalty for getting hurt. Hey, so quick addendum, there is a penalty for getting hit, you do lose points in score, but I meant a penalty in terms of health or a game over, just wanted to clear that up.
Outside of the normal levels and hubs, the last main part of Pizza Tower are the bosses. Now, I'm gonna be talking about every boss in the game here, and since this game is pretty new and there is information it actively withholds from the player until they see it regarding the bosses, I'll leave a spoiler warning here. Skip to this timestamp if you don't want the bosses, including the final one, spoiled. Our first boss is Pepperman, who is presented in both the games and comics as a pretentious, self-involved, artist-type person. And if you've been hearing me talk for this entire video, then you know I can find the humor in that. He's also a giant anthropomorphic pepper. As far as his fight goes, he's an effective first boss in that he puts up a decent challenge on a first playthrough, but becomes much easier when you become more accustomed to the game's mechanics. He effectively introduces the game's multi-phase boss fights and its tendency to have bosses throw in mix-ups and iterations on previous attacks to keep you on your toes. The only real difficulty I have fighting him is in the section where you have to carve a statue to expose his weak point, since he can easily pile on damage while you're trying to focus on the statue. Otherwise, a good and effective first boss. Our second boss is the Vigilante, a character of McPigs who's appeared in many Pizza Tower comics as well as mods for other games. His fight is probably my pick for the hardest in the game, both due to the player having a new mechanic thrust onto them in a literal gun, and due to the Vigilante's size and speed making him a tricky opponent to hit at times. He absolutely fills the screen with projectiles, and between trying to line up shots and avoiding his attacks, his fight can be pretty difficult and arduous. Not bad by any stretch though, just kind of a fight of attrition. Our third boss is also the most important character in Pizza Tower besides Pepino himself, the Noise. Now, despite just being the third boss in the current build of the game itself, the Noise is a huge part of Pizza Tower's identity. He's all over the comics and concept material, he was planned to be playable in a scrapped co-op mode, he's currently planned to be playable in a future update, he's a parody of the Noid, he's all around the game's secondary mascot. I bring all this up because his fight is probably my favorite normal boss in the game. Not only do the Noise and Pepino's personalities constantly clash throughout the fight, but you can just feel the contempt between them throughout the battle. Noise literally flips you off at one point, and his attacks are a fun mix of predictable and varied, with plenty of mix-ups thrown in. He's also fully ready to just gun Pepino down at the end of the fight, before Noisette swoops in and takes him away. I feel ya, buddy. Now, the fourth boss is interesting, because it's one that the game actively hides from the player until they fight it. We talked earlier about how Pizza Tower started development as a horror game, and that can be seen in full force with Boss 4. Fake Pepino. Fake Pepino is legitimately creepy. He's a fairly easy boss, but his presence as a weird skinwalker version of Pepino who's literally melting as you fight him is genuinely off-putting. Everything he does is a sick, twisted perversion on one of Pepino's abilities between his grab, super jumps, and taunts, and the whole fight gives off the feeling that something is very deeply wrong with the situation. After you beat him, he jump scares you with a sudden horror-esque escape section, which is notable both for its creepiness and surprise factor, as well as the fact that it's needed to be patched like eight guys damn times. Fake Pepino is a great fight and properly creepy, so I totally understand why the game chooses to hide him from you. And now, if you let me, I want to sing the praises of Pizza Tower's final boss, because it's really incredible. After fighting your way through 5 floors, 25 levels, and 4 bosses, Pepino Spaghetti has finally reached the top of the Pizza Tower, and is ready to throw down with Pizza Face. The music is intense and ominous, and Pepino is fully pissed. After a short battle that consists of throwing enemies into Pizza Face, things seem to be over until the true mastermind reveals himself, Pizza Head. So, funny story, there's an in-universe fictional video game that features Pizza Head as the main character and Pepino as the main villain. This is alluded to a lot throughout the game, with Pizza Head standees and posters and the like, and it's obviously meant to be a parallel to Mario's relationship with Wario. I bring this up because the final boss sees that fictional protagonist attempting to take his game back. Pizza Head has a lot of similar energy to Fake Pepino, with his happy-go-lucky, chaotic energy and his creepy, old-timey, yet deeply ominous boss music legitimately being unsettling, and the fight against him illustrates that he's genuinely dangerous aside from being just cuckoo bananas. He's not taking the fight seriously at all, and Pepino's had enough. You can see him getting progressively angrier and the music crescendoing further and further throughout the battle, leading into the next phase. Pepino has seemingly managed to put Pizza Head down, but he's not out. He gets back up with a surprise in store every previous boss back in here for revenge. Now, we all hate forced boss rushes and enemy gauntlets right at the end of games, so it seems like things are about to get really frustrating. We've had more than enough of these bosses at this point. But luckily, Pepino has two. <laughs> Thank you. 
Peppino, fully fed up with the hand he's been dealt, enters a state of pure, sauce-blooded Italiano rage and takes on each of his opponents one final time. The player's grab now becomes an elongated punch barrage that takes half of an enemy's health at once, and through sheer anger and exhaustion, plus some help from Gustavo, in the pouring rain and crackling thunder, Peppino brings the smackdown to every previous boss and pizza head, finishing with a tower-destroying, teary-eyed, anger-driven pile driver that finally puts pizza head out of commission. Following this, Peppino has one final escape section through the crumbling tower of pizza, rescuing all of his allies and even his enemies along the way as the pizza tower falls around them. Peppino Spaghetti's quest is over. This final boss gauntlet legitimately gave me chills my first time through it. Despite how goofy and cartoony the premise and presentation are, it's a truly climactic and cathartic moment. Pepino's been through hell in this game, all to save his life's dream of owning a restaurant, and to see him cast out his remaining stress and anxiety to fully lay out the people who've given him so much trouble is truly satisfying in a way that a game hasn't made me feel in a long time. I have no idea how this goofy cartoony pizza pasta game managed to get this kind of pure catharsis out of me, but it definitely made Managed. The fight itself is like seven phases of continued fighting, but it never feels overly long or poorly paced. Every part of it feels necessary and fully delivered on. It's an exceptional final boss and ending to the game, and after this we see Peppino, his friends, and his enemies watching and relaxing as the pizza tower crumbles, we see a montage of what they all got up to after the game, and we see all of them unwinding at Peppino's Pizza. And I think that that's the true magic of Pizza Tower. Despite being an objectively silly, funny, goofy, deliberately asinine game, it's a game that also bleeds passion and love from every pore and manages to get legitimate reactions out of the player. Like I said at the beginning of the video, this is a game that more so than anything else was clearly developed out of an extremely precise, laser-focused artistic vision with very little compromise. McPig and his team were very much able to create the game they wanted to create here. The fact that a game like Pizza Tower can exist and flourish in the modern gaming environment is a testament to the power of a thorough vision and the love for what you do. I know it's weird to wax poetic this much about the funny pizza game, but I just love that Pizza Tower exists and is allowed to be so uniquely itself. Keep in mind that I'm not someone who was actively following this game's development. For all I knew, this game was nowhere near coming out when I saw its Steam page. I bought it on a whim and loved it this much. I can't imagine how cathartic and intensely satisfying it must have been for longtime patrons, Discord members, and active followers of this game's development when it dropped and was this good. Truly a magical moment, I'm sure. If you're all interested in platformers, 2D platformers specifically, good indie games, games with great art, games with great music, or hell, just good games in general, play Pizza Tower. It's only $20, and I promise you that nothing compares. Thanks for watching, and thanks to McPig and his team for this incredible game. Hey, thanks for watching. Hopefully, if you're watching this video on launch day, it came out right at the tail end of February, maybe the beginning of March, but here's hoping for February. <laughs> if you enjoy it, I really appreciate a like, comment, or a sub. Comments, especially, and subs are some of my favorite things to get on this channel. I love just being at work and checking my phone and seeing a new comment. It's really nice. If not, though, I totally understand. Hope you all have a fantastic day before, during, and after watching. Stay pizza-tastic, and I'll catch you all later. Thanks, and cheers.